I uh, was talking to a gentleman the other day and just asked him if he had been kind of following along with us and he said, yeah, I said, uh, he's really been enjoying what I've been posting, uh, the messages, and uh, he said, you know, one of the major things that he's run across in his life is that people really didn't know what the gospel was. And so that kind of got me thinking that that's one of the things that we haven't really discussed uh, is what is the good news or the gospel. So my message today evolved out of that and it's uh, entitled, Have You Heard the Good News? And, you know, today, just another day, just about like any other day in our lives is a general rule. And we wake and we go eat breakfast, we look around, <clears throat> go through the day, and then we go to bed. It's just a regular day. And like so many other days before, but is this the way things should be for us as believers. Should we just wake up, go through life, and go to bed day after day after day with no thought and no purpose about what we do? I don't think so. I think that we should be expecting great things on a daily basis. I think we should be preparing ourselves for great things on a daily basis. And we should be living great things on a daily basis. <clears throat> if we aren't, why aren't we? Haven't you heard the good news? Maybe you have and maybe you haven't. Maybe you don't understand what the good news is. <laughs> uh, can anyone describe for me just what is the good news as found in the Bible? You know, we hear about it, but do we have the ability to tell someone what the good news is? Paul, <clears throat> if you turn to Romans 1.16... He talks about the good news. He says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Okay. Now, we've got a slight turn on this same thought there in Romans 1.1 1, 1, where Paul says, uh, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle and separated unto the gospel of God. So, on the one hand, we have a gospel of God and on the other hand, we have a gospel of Christ. Are they the same thing? Or are they two different things? We sometimes forget to talk about these issues. <clears throat> well, are we to follow the gospel of God or are we to follow the gospel of Christ if they're two different things? And, you know, <clears throat> this isn't real confusing as far as what we have, it's just a matter of looking at it properly. The words in the New Testament that have come to us as the gospel or the good news is just simply euangelion. It means good and news or a good announcement. And in the, the Hebrew, it's very similar. Uh, it's uh, sorat Elohim, which uh, again means a an announcement uh, of God. But when we look at it, 
we have to begin with, well, what is good news to you? Or to you? Or to you? What is it that's good about whatever news that we have heard? Is good news to you that my turkeys are up on your porch? I mean, that would be good news for you. Is it good news that you won the lotto or that your family's in town? What is the good news of God or Christ? While all of these things that we experience may be good, but do things like this actually represent what the good news of the gospel really is? Well, since all the people that we read about in the Bible are basically all Jews, let's just look at it and see what the Jews thought a good news would be. It's in the Bible. Now, the word in Hebrew for this good news is actually very close, closely related to the Hebrew word for flesh, or basar. It's very similar. It's actually from the same root. And, you know, the Jews, they loved to play on words. They were big wordplay people. So, we read an interesting thing in Ezekiel 36, 23 and following, where God is speaking to man about man's sinfulness. There's an interesting verse here in 26, and God speaks about replacing a stony heart with one that is made of flesh. And then this same root is the word that we get the gospel or the word for glad tidings from in Hebrew. So a part of the news or the good news is that God replaces our hearts that are stony and evil and dead with a heart that is living and beating and desirous of God. So a big part of the good news is that God changes our heart. The living heart that God gives us is gladdened. Okay? From the word for good news. And it's made alive because God's Spirit is sent to dwell within us. And this causes us to desire to live for God and be His people. People who draw near to God and live in an intimate relationship with Him. God also says that when His heart is gladdened, or this heart is gladdened, that we will be made whole from our lives of sinfulness and that God will provide in abundance for us and that this will be done so that the unbelievers will know that yud heh vav is God. So here we have in Ezekiel an explanation to us what the glad tidings are. That's why we have to look at the Old Testament to understand the New Testament. Verse 29 and 30 here in Ezekiel are unusual. We need to take a quick look at them because of their implications on our own life. Verse 29 says, And I also save you, I will also save you from all your uncleanness, and I will call for the corn and will increase it, and lay no famine upon you. 
verse 30, and I will multiply the fruit of the tree and the increase of the field that ye shall receive no more reproach of famine among the heathen. What do we see here? It doesn't make really sense. We have corn, fruit, fields, reproach, famine, and heathens. What we need to look at and understand here in this passage is that it is foreshadowing exactly what was happening in the first century after the Holy Spirit fell upon the disciples. And then on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit fell upon the masses at the temple. So if you think about it, you can start to see the imagery in your mind that comes up. What does the New Testament say about corn? Or sometimes translated as wheat or a kernel of seed of some kind. Well, in John 12, 24, in the King James, it states, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall to the ground and die, it abides alone. But if it die, it brings forth much fruit. My translation in John uh, 12, 24 reads a little bit uh, similar, but a little different. Amen, amen. I say to you, unless a berry of wheat falls into the midst of the earth and dies, it will remain alone, without offspring as survivors to carry on. But when it dies, it makes a lot of fruit or offspring. God has to take that stony, hard covering of our hearts as unbelievers. And that heart has to die. We have to die to our sinful nature in order for us to live for God. The world doesn't live for God. This is what happened to the disciples. Were they living for, for God or for Jesus before He was crucified and rose? They all got scared and ran away. They were broken and alone and spiritually dead before the resurrection and the fall of the Holy Spirit. But this is when God became alive for them. The Holy Spirit came in power and transformed them from death to life. Their hearts became alive again. Their spirit was renewed. <clears throat> what happened? When that occurred, God began to multiply the fruits, both physical bodies into the kingdom, but also the spiritual fruit as the kingdom began to grow. What's Galatians say? 5.22 But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. These fruits burst forth within the life of the disciples after the Holy Spirit became alive in their hearts. Not only the fruits became multiplying in their lives, but the fields began to ripen to harvest. What happened just shortly after the Holy Spirit fell upon the disciples. The day of Pentecost. You had 3,000 that suddenly were harvested into Jesus' kingdom. And the fields were still white with harvest. To the point by 
approximately 90 A.D., it was estimated to be over 50,000 believers just in the Jerusalem area. A huge harvest came into the kingdom. Look at verse 30 again. And I will multiply the fruit of the tree and the increase of the field that ye shall receive no more reproach of famine among the heathens. If we look at this stuff literally, sometimes it confuses us. We have to look at what happens later. So the fruits became even more numerous. The fields became greater with harvest, ready to be forgiven of their sins, and ready to become members of Jesus' kingdom. A people of power and authority upon the earth, no longer to remain in sinful scorn amongst the heathen and being like the heathen. They were no more to reproach of the famine among the heathen. They were to come out from being like the heathen. Dead. Spiritually dead. Powerless and hard-hearted. Having full of doubt and spiritual famine in their life. Ever looking for someone to save them on an earthly basis. They were looking for an earthly ruler to rule over them. But they forgot all about the spiritual nature of their needs. That's the key. We have to get right in the Spirit. So here we have an inkling of what the good news or the gospel of God really is. God has a plan for us to become righteous and to receive power and honor and come out from among the unrighteous. God wants us to become His people who acknowledge Him as God and sovereign ruler in our lives. Just as we watched the guy today on the, the show, oh, I'm, I'm my own God. I, I'm my own Savior. You know, I, if I don't do something, nothing good is ever going to become me if I don't do everything myself. No. God has a plan and that plan is for Him to be the sovereign in our life. And this sounds pretty good to me. That's the gospel of God. But what's the good news of Christ? Can it even get better than just the gospel of God? Well, in Romans 1.16, go back and look at that, Paul says that being ashamed of the gospel of Christ would leave us powerless unto sin and death. Is that what it says? Look at what Paul says says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first and also the Greek. <clears throat> Paul says that being ashamed of the gospel of Christ would leave us powerless to sin and death. Isn't that what he said in just different words? This is an important point. What Paul is telling us here when he says, I am not ashamed.
What is He telling us? Where do we find out what being ashamed the implication is? Go to Isaiah 41. Verse 10 and following, there is an interesting concept. And I want to read this to you. Verse 10 says, Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee. Yea, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of righteousness. Behold, all they that were incensed against thee shall be ashamed and confounded. They shall be as nothing, and they that strive with thee shall perish. Thou shalt seek them and shall not find them, even them that contend with thee. They that war against thee shall be as nothing and as a thing of naught. For I, thy Lord, thy God, will hold thy right hand, saying unto thee, Fear not, I will help thee. So how does this passage relate to us and not being ashamed? Paul is telling us he is not ashamed of the gospel and is saying that he is no longer striving with God or others within Jesus' kingdom. All of that striving that people do, it's not real productive. You know, a guy just died who was a big striver. And... You know, I don't need to mention any names, but he brought a lot of disdain upon the kingdom of God because he caused so much turmoil as a pastor of a Baptist church. I don't want to denigrate Baptists, but this man caused tremendous turmoil because he was striving within God's kingdom here upon the earth by being hateful. And Paul lets us know that if we're always striving with God or hateful to God or others, then we will perish. <clears throat> Not just physically, but spiritually. We have to accept the rule of God in our lives and unify with Jesus and God in their purposes and their existence and by doing so, God will hold our right hands. And you know what holding the right hand is? Okay. What does the right hand symbolize? It symbolizes your power. Your authority. So God will uphold our power and authority. And this goes right back to what I told you all a few weeks ago, back in Isaiah 40, or 29 and 30, say that God will exchange our power with His power. When God does this, exchange with us when we give Him our hearts, Suddenly, we have the power via God to harvest the fields that are white to harvest. If God's not with us, how do we ever expect to harvest the fields? They're not going to be harvested by us. Who's going to harvest them? So the good news or gospel of Christ is the power of God unto salvation. If we look at what Jesus is, He is the salvation of God. That's what His name means. Yeshuat Elohim, the salvation of God in the flesh. 
Jesus is that part of God that has fought for us so that we could be in a state of salvation within the existence of God and His kingdom. So the good news of Jesus is a bit different than the good news of God. Just a little bit. God proclaimed that the salvation of God is coming and is near at hand. And He told us about what will happen when that salvation occurs. And that's pretty good. But the gospel of the good news of Jesus is that salvation is here now. You don't have to wait for it. It's here and it dwells within the personage of Jesus and that you can be a part of His kingdom upon the earth in power and authority now. It's not in the sweet by and by. Salvation is now. It's for every person now. So while Paul says he's committed to the good news of God, which we all should be committed to that good news of God because His plan of salvation was from the beginning of time. But he's really committed to the good news of the Gospel of Christ because that was today. Jesus is ready to save anyone who calls upon Him. Amen. Anybody. And I know you guys have heard stories about somebody lying on their deathbed and they cry out unto God and accept Him right then, right before they take their last breath. I don't think there's a thing wrong with that. When they get to heaven, I think God's going to be overjoyed and Jesus is going to be overjoyed that they're there. They may be saying, well, you just missed out on a whole truckload of blessings that you could have experienced had you accepted me 50, 70 years before. But that doesn't mean God isn't rejoicing when anybody at any time comes to know Him in a personal way. Jesus is ready by saving us from ourselves and our sin, Jesus transforms our hearts and minds and He brings life. He creates life from our dead spirits. He takes that death that we are fully committed in and changes it to life. <clears throat> By confessing our sinful nature and asking God to simply forgive us of our sins, God is just to forgive us of our sins, no matter what they are. But we have to continue to exist within God's existence for us to continue to experience that power of God in our lives and continue to have that glad heart that is a product of both the good news of Christ and God. And I want to begin to close by stressing one very important point. And that is this fact. A powerless gospel is not good news. Now, did you hear what I said? A powerless gospel 
is not good news. I don't care which way you try to slice it, dice it, and throw it out there. If your gospel is just to come up here, be baptized, and sit back in the pew, that is a powerless gospel, and it's not doing me or anybody else any good. God has to exist within our hearts in a powerful way and transform our literal being from the ground up. We've all heard the stories about the people who come to church on Sunday, sin all week, and come back and repeat the process. Day in, day out, week in, week in, out, and it never changes. If God is not allowed to change your heart from death to life, your God is powerless. And you set yourself up to be God. So God or Jesus that has no power in your life is not good news to others or even yourself because there's nothing alive within your spirit that can help another who desperately needs life and desperately needs the life-giving spirit to heal and to change their heart. We must be like that grain of wheat or corn of the seed that falls to the ground in fertile ground and dies and brings forth fruit. We have to be willing to prepare the hearts by experiencing God in our own life that when people see us they say I want what you have it's not a physical thing it's a spiritual thing and we talked about that this morning you know when people look a bit different we kind of oh they don't look like us they don't act like us but I'm telling you I've seen people who didn't look exactly as I thought they should, but their spirit was so overwhelmingly beautiful, you can't help but love them. It's spirit that makes the gospel of Jesus Christ and God work. It's the spirit thing because it's spiritual fruit that is born. We have to get rid of that stony heart of our fleshly man and allow God to bring forth that spiritual fruit so that other people will want to know why we have that hope and joy in our life. Because that's not something that you're going to find in any aisle of the physical world. Because there is no hope and no joy to those who do not know Christ. And so today, you know, if you've never accepted Jesus as Lord of your life and asked forgiveness for the sins, it's time to do it. Amen. We all have to ask forgiveness on a daily basis in order to keep our heart pure before God. God is ready to take away our shame and give us joy and move us into a powerful walk with Jesus upon the earth if we just ask. But the real question is are you ready for the good news to burst, burst forth in your life today? Are you ready to experience that power and authority 
that Christ brings and wants to bring with the Holy Spirit cleansing us and empowering us so that God can take our right hand and walk us through life. And that, folks, is what the good news is. The good news is not me telling you, yeah, Jesus is alive. We listen to a sermon every Sunday morning. Yeah, come and sit here and fall asleep listening to my boring sermons and, you know, you'll have fun. No. The good news is power. It's joy. It's life-giving. It's transformative. It's healing. Jesus lives. He lives in my heart. He lives in your heart, in your heart, in your heart, in your heart. He lives in all our hearts. And it's time to let Him rule. God wants to rule. He wants to not just kind of dwell in a dark corner of our heart. He wants to rule our lives.